Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at a game by the great Jose Raul Capablanca. He had the white pieces in this one, again, Sevilli Tartakauer. This was played in New York, 1924. And it's a nice example of rook and pawn endgame play. In particular, the great strength the king and rook have when they are coordinated well. So let's dive in and see how this one played out. We have a Dutch defense on board. And neither side wastes any time. Very efficient development for both. Bishop outside the pawn chain. If there was one uh, player who made the biggest impression on my own play as a younger player, I'd have to say it's Capablanca. I've gone through plenty of his games, and uh, I enjoy his uh, simplistic style. A lot of attention is given to the e4 square in this game. Multiple minor pieces are now pointing there for each side. Castles, queen e8, a typical pivot in the Dutch, preparing a transfer to the king side. And with move 9, queen e2, white has already connected rooks and is preparing a central expansion. So black wants to stop this and does knight e4, offering a dark square bishop exchange. And this happens, black isn't too quick to immediately recapture, wants to create some weaknesses and uh, in the white queen side, captures on c3 first, and now there's a damaged structure, only now do we have a recapture on e7, and in comes a4, so this is a twofold move, one, the idea is to create some tension, exchange off this isolated pawn for a perfectly healthy pawn, and two, stop the queen from getting active. This is a potential pivot point, and from a3, she's quite the invasive piece, putting pressure on an isolated pawn and a weak link on c3. So a4 rules that out altogether. The rook is now there defending a3. So black opts for this variation, creating a new imbalance in the position, minor piece imbalance. Certainly other avenues, knight c3 is perfectly fine, looking for uh, knight a5. But okay. We have bishop takes knight, queen takes bishop, knight c6, and rook f to b1. So working with this half-open file, there's one downside here, the doubled c pawns, but at the same time there's also some play for one of the white rooks. Now that the pawns are doubled, b files half-opened. An idea behind this point, uh, behind this move is to meet the move knight a5, with c5. So in the game it's rook to e8, but if knight a5 is played, white has c5, which is basically going to undouble the pawns. White will be able to exchange off the c pawn for the b pawn. The idea here is to meet captures with rook to b5, a double attack. White will soon be getting the pawn back. Okay, in the game it's rook a to e8, some prep work for an e5 break. White plays queen h3. This is coordinating well with the bishop, exerting pressure on f5 and h7. So this freezes both the e pawn and the f pawn. If the f pawn moves, h7 collapses, and if this guy moves, f5 collapses. And the other point behind queen to h3 is seen next to get the f pawn contributing to some central control. And this ties in really well with the bishop. Pawns on dark, bishop on light. Knight a5. Queen gets back involved towards the center here, supporting e4. And black prepares e5. So this is where things could really heat up. White gives up on this idea, preparing to play a rook to b5 move. There's good reason for that. Now we got these rooks that are ready to be brought to life in, you know, in just a moment with e5. The e-file can open up. The b-file is not where you want to be in this, in this case. So we have a quick transfer. The rook is best placed on e1. Preparing, preparing to meet e5 with e4. This is where things could really heat up. In the game, it's queen to d7. But if e5 is in, white would strike right back just creating a, a ton of tension, and these pawn exchanges are desirable for white. 
having the superior minor piece, having the long range piece, I should be saying. Having the bishop more pawn exchanges, the better. It would be nice to eliminate this pawn so the bishop can see one of the squares right next to the king. Okay, this doesn't hit. Queen d7 in the game. White hits first, e4. We have a capture. Queen takes. h7 is struck at. g6 to defend. And now the next few moves just kind of consolidating. g3 for starters. The queen no longer has to babysit. King f8 is preparing a d5 break, adding some security to the rook. King f8. King g2. Rook f7. Expanding on the king side now. This is related to uh, the bishop. Well, the pawn is trying to coordinate with the bishop on g6 one day, breaking down this structure. d5, c takes, e takes, and now queens are gone. And what to do in this position? Well, first, let's identify weak points. Pawns are a big deal in this endgame. Where are the weak links for each side? For white, it's c3. It's backward. And a4. Now, of these two, uh, c3 is the one that's a bit more accessible. The rook is not long off from putting pressure on it. a4, it's not nearly as accessible. Notice the, the pawns that I'm highlighting over here Another reason why we may be identifying them as weak or, you know, potential targets in this endgame is because the king is far away from helping to defend them if there's pressure on them. So, and you really don't want to devote a bishop or a rook to babysitting these weak points, c3 or a4. You want to go on the offensive. So, I mentioned a couple of weak points in white's camp. What about black? Where is black deficient? Well, at the moment it doesn't seem like there are any targets in black's camp until Capablanca plays h5. So now g6 certainly has some heat on it. Two attackers, one defender, you have to do something about that. And you may think to just take on h5, but this would not be a good idea because after this quick transfer of the rook to h1, this pawn will be won next, and once it's on h5, an additional pawn will be won there wouldn't be a way to defend both h7 and d5. So, what does black have to do? Babysit. g6. And there's still this idea in mind to put pressure on the weak point. We have a capture on h6. So, this is the weak point for black. This is the main weak point for white. Continuing, we get some rook activity. Rook h1, open file. And now rook h7. This is really the ideal placement for the rook. Seventh rank. Cutting off the king. In this endgame, you want to have the kings contributing. Black king cannot do that. And the rook is observing any of the black pawns that have not yet moved. Prepared to pick them all off. Or maybe even get behind one if it prepares to bolt. So... One of the points behind king to f8, by the way, is to sidestep a skewer, right? If black tries to just hunt down this pawn, that's going to be painful. So the king goes to a dark square. White gets on the seventh. Rook c6 only now. And what to do about the c3 pawn? Well, you can't defend it. So what does white do in the meantime? Pushes a pawn. And... Is it a good choice to take on c3? It's not. If black takes this pawn, white's going to take this pawn. And who benefits? White, for sure. Let's have a look at that. If this rook captures on c3, if both weak pawns are captured, well, because the white pawn is gone on c3, it doesn't mean that black has now any past pawns, whereas... Without the g6 pawn around, white has acquired past pawns. Two, in fact, are now uh, connected and passed. This is enormous. This would be enormous for white. This would not be a good exchange for black to, give, to take the c pawn and give up the g pawn. So 
Black gets the knight involved. G5, not F5. You don't want to exchange a weak pawn for a perfectly healthy F pawn. You want to win this pawn, if possible. Knight E3, King F3, and Knight to F5. So what just happened with this sequence? Knight C4, E3, F5. The knight is simply shielding the bishop from observing the weak point which means the rook is now ready to snip the c3 pawn and not lose uh, this weak point g6. So what is Kappa's idea here? First, it's a capture. And after the recapture, pop quiz to you, what move would you play in this position as white? Feel free to pause the video. Okay. Uh, basically, the winning plan here, this brilliant idea that Capablanca had in this game, is to give up a couple pawns in order to activate the king. This, this rook is already ideally placed. Doesn't get any better than that. The king is cut off from any of the action. And if the king could only somehow get involved, get nearby the king, or nearby the rook, there's all sorts of mating threats or the possibility to escort this pawn to promotion. Key move here is king g3. c3 now falls with check, but white moves forward and will not stop moving forward either. Rook f3 in the game is actually a losing move. Um, not the best resistance with rook to f3. The computer is suggesting a6 will uh, go back to this position in a, in a little bit. In the game, we had rook to f3, and now pawn pushes. Rook takes f4, another pawn goes down with check, king g5, and rook to e4. It's important that the rook not get too greedy. Um, taking on e4 in this position allows a super strong post. The idea here is not to take f5. This is a very nice... Uh, Example, this is a, a really a beautiful game, instructive game, rook and pawn endgame, plenty of cases where you want to actually hide behind an enemy pawn. Why is this a good idea? Well, you're not vulnerable to some file checks. You can maintain your king position. So if the rook captured in this position on d4, the king goes to f6, and what are you doing about the mate threat? Right, this, is the, this is the great strength I'm, I'm speaking of. When the king and rook are working well together, rook on the seventh, the king nearby, controlling these squares, the rook is ready to just hit black with that game over move. And also, the pawn is ready to push through. There's simply no good defense here for team black. Just as an example, king e8, you could, multiple ways to do it, but you could just push straight away, give a check, and eventually the rook has to give itself up, and this is a one position for white. So what does black do? Black plays rook to e4, preparing to have the rook come defend uh, the back rank, rook to e8 move. King f6, again, not taking the pawn, using it to kind of shield the king from some file checks. There's a mate threat. King g8, defense. White inserts a check. There's multiple approaches here, but I like this one best. Capablanca's choice to insert the check forcing the king on a square so that when, once the pawn moves, it hits with check. So a nice, nice in-between move before snipping the c7 pawn. Once more, mate threat is on board. The rook drops back to defend. And, well, black is now on their back foot. Material at the moment, black is up a pawn. Black was up two pawns, now is only up one pawn, but not anymore. Material is now bounced because of this great activity with the white rook and king working well together. Material is bounced and black is just completely defensive. The king could never get active. So rook e4 in the game, king f6 renewing a mate threat. Rook f4, king e5. And after rook to g4, we have this pawn push with check and it cannot be captured. Um, if you enter a king and pawn endgame, this is simply winning for Team White. This is just one 
quick example. This is how it would play out. And yeah, this pawn now bolts. So you can't take on g7. King g8 in the game, rook takes a. Again, notice how those, those pawns are just falling. The rook is just enormous on the seventh ring, cutting the king, observing all the black pawns that haven't moved. We get a few more moves in. It wasn't long ago before white was down two pawns. Now they're up two pawns, and black is completely dead. In fact, after just a few more moves here, we have resignation by Tartakower. This pawn, there's no stopping it. A couple more moves. The rook is there to defend the promotion square. Black goes ahead and resigns. And if it continued, b5, d7, here, check, here. And, of course, we're going to be winning this pawn and the game soon enough. So, very instructive game. I do want to go back to this key moment. Now that you see this, this idea of the king slipping in here, this is an important moment. This move here allows white to establish a really strong king post on f6. This must be prevented, or black needs to stay in a position to challenge the king post on f6. How do you do this? The best move in this position is a6. In the game, it was rook here. Quick replay, it was here, 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 and eventually the king gets to f6. How do you combat this strong king post on f6? This is how you do it. A6, this is apparently the best line to put up uh, resistance here as black. A6 is preparing to create a passed pawn with B5. So after a move like this, we would have B5, let's say a capture. Both sides have a passer. King here, this pawn could continue to push, and here's the idea. King F6, you could challenge that post because the rook's stays on c3. Didn't go pawn hunting. There would be the move rook to c6, challenging the strong king post. So the strength of a rook on the seventh rank, combined with that rook mating threats, as well as simply escorting this pawn to promotion land, it's a big deal. It's a great strength in the game. And a uh, really brilliant play by the great Capablanca in this one. Okay, as usual, feel free to leave any feedback to this video in the comments section below, and I will catch you soon. That's all for now. Take care.